Yeah, thanks for joining. I'm uh, very excited to be here. I'll give like a very quick introduction about myself, uh, and then I'll I'll just kind of jump right in. So um, I am a food writer, and I've uh, I also make videos about food history, uh, which you can find my uh, social media is down below, which is called Pass the Flamingo because um, on Instagram and TikTok because the ancient Romans ate flamingos. Uh, was where the name originally came from. But uh, I also write for the food publication Gastro Obscura. And um, I, I've done uh, some various presentations about uh, food in different historical and ancient societies. And this is one that I've always been kind of particularly uh, fascinated by um, because it is so, it's, I, I find the, the Aztecs particularly interesting when it comes to food because it's so unique and familiar at the same time. It's like kind of a combination of things that are recognizable to us today and things that are really just unique and really like nothing else in history. Um, the, the image, by the way, that uh, is on the screen now is from a source called the Florentine Codex, which we're going to be hearing more about. And uh, the little uh, sort of curly things uh, flowing through the air are supposed to represent speech. Um, and you'll see that in a lot of um, in a lot of Aztec art. But for me, the most interesting things about uh, the food uh, that we're gonna be talking about is, is, its, it, yeah, is its creativity and ingenuity and their, their way of taking a lack of resources and uh, turning it into, um, you know, it, it, it being able to survive off of basically very limited means. So um, when it comes to uh, the Aztecs, uh, as far as our sources of information, of course, we can get a lot of information from like material archeology, span from uh, from art uh, and also from actual physical remains that are that are found. Um, one thing which you might have heard because they use this term in a lot of uh, archaeological contexts is uh, middens, which are uh, middens are uh, preserved archaeological garbage dumps. Basically, they're places where people might throw away the refuse and scraps from their food. So if you think like by looking at our garbage today, we can learn. Uh, about the consumption of a given household of like what products they're buying or what they're eating. So it's the same for, for, um, you know, historical societies. One of the most unfortunate things, though, when it comes to learning about the Aztecs is that most of the information that we have is from the era of the Spanish conquest. So most of the documented history is from that time period because the uh, there was written uh, ancient Mesoamerican literature and and uh, you know all kinds of scrolls and preserved documents that were largely lost or destroyed uh, during the colonial era. So we're a bit biased because we're hearing about it first of all from the perspective of the Spanish, but also it's just this one little narrow time period of like the 16th century. A lot of times is all we have to go on with the written sources. But that brings us to our most uh, interesting written source, which I mentioned already, um, the Florentine Codex. So this is a book on, it, it's the most important source on the daily life of the Aztecs, and it's sometimes called the first modern ethnography because of this. Um, it's it's a series of many different books, uh, I think 15 or 16 volumes, and um, it was composed in the era shortly after the conquest by uh, under the supervision of uh, Bernardino de Sahagún, who was a Franciscan monk and historian. Um, and uh, he was uh, he was interested in basically documenting the culture of these people who he was like working with and and in in the new new Spain as they called it um, in the in the the colony. And so uh, in this text, they go into all kinds of different things like religious beliefs and various customs, but also quite a lot of time is spent on food. And it's written side by side in Spanish and Nahuatl, which is the Aztec language. Um, that's another uh, image from it down below. We're going to see a bunch of more uh, images from it. But another thing, by the way, just recently, uh, the Florentine Codex, the full text of it became available online, like like scanned uh, images of the entire uh, text. So if you're interested, definitely check that out. And if you uh, if you know Spanish or can read Spanish, um, I, I have found that the uh, the Spanish of the Florentine Codex is actually not that different from modern Spanish. Like it's surprisingly easy to understand. But anyway. Um, of course, there's a lot of modern Mexican uh, traditions that descend directly from the original Mesoamerican inhabitants of, of the region. Um, and some of the images on this slide uh, show examples of that. So there's certain particular uh, indigenous tools, like traditional tools that are still used, like um, 
the woman in the image on the upper left is grinding corn uh, using what's called today a metate, but used to be called a metat uh, within in Nahuatl. And so it's a it's a traditional type of corn grindstone. The other the round uh, kind of flat griddle is called a comal. Um, that is another very, very ancient tool that people have been using in Mesoamerica for centuries, and they still use it today um, for, you know, dry roasting uh, tortillas or, or vegetables or, or whatever ingredients. And you can see in the image from the Florentine Codex, you can see uh, it's supposed to be a mother instructing her daughter in um, making food, basically. And you can see she's using a metate. There's also something labeled as a comal and various other things uh, surrounding them. So... Modern Mexican food has, a, it, just like any modern cuisine, it's accepted lots of new influences and changes, like a lot of ingredients that we commonly associate with Mexican food today, which we'll get into a bit later, um, weren't, weren't there yet, uh, because they were introduced from, from Europe. Um, so modern Mexican food does have a lot in common, like certain key things are have, have remained unchanged, like corn being uh, the central grain of the diet. But there's a lot of other things that have been kind of added over time. Um, I also want to give a little bit of just a little bit of historical context um, so that we kind of know uh, before we really dive into talking about the food uh, so that we understand uh, what we're talking about. So, um, you know, back in uh, prehistory, uh, prehistoric times, there's lots and lots of different uh, ethnic groups, different tribes in the region that is now um, Mexico. Another interesting thing is that the Aztecs referred to this region as um, historically as uh, Sem Anahuac, which means the one world. Um, and that was that was kind of the, the ancient name of Mexico. So around the sixth century uh, is when uh, people uh, speaking the language Nahuatl move in from, we, we believe, the American Southwest. And then around the 13th century, this one particular tribal group um, with a confederation of others establishes dominance over, um, over the others in the region. Uh, they are called the Mexica, which is, of course, the origin of the modern word Mexico. And some people today actually do prefer uh, the term Mexica instead of Aztec because it's technically more precise. I'm just using Aztec for like convenience, but technically um, the Mexica would have been what they called themselves. And so they're just one group of many different like Nahuan, uh, Nahuans or Nahuatl speaking peoples, basically. They build their capital city. Uh, in a place uh, called uh, the Lake uh, Lake uh, Texcoco, uh, which um, is at the site of present day Mexico City, um, and so this this is Tenochtitlan, which is this amazing um, you know feat of engineering that's built basically on the lake. Uh, and there's the historical uh, tradition that um, it was you know they chose this location because the gods gave them a sign of um, an, uh, an eagle eating a cactus, or sorry, an eagle standing on top of a cactus eating a snake uh, and that in the middle of the lake. And that gave, showed them the sign where to build the city. And um, this is why that symbol of uh, the eagle with the snake on the cactus is on the flag of Mexico still today. So uh, in 1519 is when Hernan Cortes arrives and through uh, a, a playing local different groups of people against the Mexica who had created many enemies basically through their do, uh, political dominance uh, by, uh, you know, in 1520 to 21 is when the Aztecs are conquered by the Spanish. And so the colony of New Spain or uh, uh, Nueva España is, is uh, officially established. And for the Spanish, the, this particular territory is like kind of the crown jewel of their, of their vast uh, North American uh, territories. And the Spanish will rule New Spain for exactly 300 years. Uh, it was like 300 years to the, to the year. Um, I, I, I find, I, I think it's important to begin with all of this because it, we have this perception today often when we talk about Mesoamerican indigenous societies, we tend to think of them as ancient or uh, and not only ancient but as like extinct almost as as gone or forgotten and it's important to remember that not only is this history not particularly ancient we're talking about things that happened just a couple of centuries ago but also um you know the the Nahuatl language is still spoken in Mexico today and and people still have preserved a lot of their a lot of their traditions um even despite um the centuries of colonial rule so I mentioned uh, a bit earlier how um, modern Mexican food is like a combination of uh, the indigenous traditions, but there's been so many new, um, so many new influences that they have expected or accepted. So 
Try to picture modern Mexican food without any of the following things. Uh, and as you know, as you look down the list, these are a lot of things that we very commonly associate with Mexican food today. The Aztecs were eating at the time of the conquest, they were eating a diet that was primarily plant-based. Um, only elite people had a lot of meat in their diet. And even then they didn't have any livestock animals that uh, were capable of producing uh, dairy that people could consume. The only livestock animals that they really had, which you can see in this image was turkeys, and small dogs, which were also raised for food. There's also some evidence that they may have raised quails as well for um, their eggs and meat. But meat in general was really not a very widespread uh, part of uh, people's diet. So as a result of this lack of animal fat and dairy, um, one of the most striking things about indigenous Mesoamerican food is that they were cooking largely without fat. Uh, they they didn't fry things. They didn't. Um, they really didn't use oil or fat too much in their cooking. They would um, predominantly cook things by boiling, steaming, or or dry roasting. Especially dry roasting was a was a very common technique. Um, this diorama is uh, in the National Museum of Archaeology in Mexico City. I actually saw it when I visited Mexico last year, and it's a it's a really beautiful diorama. But this is supposed to show a busy, thriving uh, marketplace scene in the Aztec capital of, of Tenochtitlan. Um, so uh, moving on. Um, another, uh, one of the really interesting things to uh, consider when we're looking at what are the Aztecs eating is they were constrained in some ways by their environment um, because their, their society is centered around a region called the Valley of Mexico, which Mexico is Mexico is quite a large country. So there's a lot of different climate zones. When you get down towards the south, it's it's more tropical and humid. Um, but in the central upper like highlands region, it, it's kind of warm and dry. And there's also these alkaline lakes, um, these, these lakes that have a high mineral content, which makes them a very unique environment. Um, the world of the Aztecs kind of environmentally is not really there anymore. Um, some animals have gone extinct, including species that may have only lived in, a, in one of the lakes. Um, and, you know, some of the food sources they had access to back then didn't exist anymore. But there were things that they, because of their environment, could not access. Like a great example of this is honey. Um, the Aztecs traded with the Maya who lived in the more tropical regions to the south. The, um, the Maya were uh, were beekeepers and they traded bee honey, uh, but the Aztecs couldn't produce honey from bees on their own because the bees could not survive in this particular environment because the species of bee they were using was uh, tropical. And same with certain crops that they would acquire from trading. Like they they used cacao and they used vanilla, but those are from plants that grow in, in the rainforest, that grow down south in the tropical region. So they also had to trade those things and get them from their neighbors. So it, they, they were able to build this kind of vast, um, you know, trading network. Uh, and that, that was a, a major way of supplementing their diet. But uh, because of their sort of, lack uh because of a lack of arable land in the region around the lakes um they figured out how to basically make their own agricultural land which is one of the most fascinating uh achievements of engineering um of the aztecs so dating back to around the year 1100 you have these things called in modern spanish they're called chinampas um the ancient name of them was chinamit and they are um they're sometimes been known as floating gardens, which isn't really accurate because they're artificial islands. They're artificial islands that are constructed for the purpose of agriculture. And some of these are still in use today. Um, there's some that are very close to Mexico City and others not too far, uh, too far out. But you can see in this diagram kind of how these were constructed. They planted trees to stabilize uh, these rows where they would fill in with soil artificially. And then they would take these narrow boats and go uh, up and down in the waterways, up and down the rows um, in order to harvest the, the crops. They would also fertilize uh, the, the chinampas with, um, with human waste, actually, that was collected from, from the city because they didn't have any livestock animals like we might use cow manure or something to fertilize uh, crops. So what exactly kind of things are they growing in these, uh, in these chinampas? The, 
Um, of course, some of the key crops are things that are still very iconic and recognizable in Mexico today, especially corn. We'll talk more about corn later. Also tomatoes, chili peppers. Um, and what's remarkable is that as the Florentine Codex tells us, there were tons of different varieties and different cultivars of all of these things. Like tomatoes could be yellow or red or green. They had just as many different kinds of chilies as there are today and tons and tons of different varieties and colors of corn. Um, there was there was just a tremendous amount of variety in the agriculture that they were practicing, uh, despite their kind of limited means. But incorporating protein into the diet was always kind of a, a major challenge. Um, you you may have heard of the what they call the um, the three sisters in uh, in North American indigenous societies of corn, uh, beans, and squash as being three crops that are often grown together that provide a pretty nutritionally complete diet when you take them all together. And this was definitely kind of the backbone of the of the Aztec uh, diet as well. Um, since, but as far as animal protein, they often came up with very creative ways of finding um, additional uh, sources, which we'll talk about. So uh, as I've already mentioned, um, you know, meat is eaten very rarely. The primary grain is corn, uh, but not the only one. Um, they were also growing amaranth uh, as well as chia. Amaranth was a was a major one. Um, and amaranth, which if you're not familiar with it, is like very, very tiny little grains. Uh, and it's super high in iron and in, in other nutrients. It's very healthy. Um, amaranth was... Uh, you know, used as uh, it was used in some religious rituals that led to the Spanish actually banning the the growing of amaranth for a time, which I'll uh, talk about more later. But they had a lot of fruits and veggies that would be familiar to us. Um, you know, aside from the aforementioned uh, beans and squash uh, and tomato, avocado is a major one. Uh, cactus were grown uh, for just as in Mexico today, people ate the pads as well as the fruit. Um, and you'll, uh, you'll also corn smut, uh, you may have heard of, is still a delicacy in Mexico. It's a fungus that grows on corn. Uh, it tastes rather like uh, mushrooms. It, it's known as huitlacoche, which is a name directly from Nahuatl. Um, and a, a lot of the names of these crops do come from Nahuatl, because what happened was after the Spanish arrived, um, these, these crops as valuable commodities started to be traded all over the world in what's known as the Colombian Exchange. Um, when people started growing, you know, corn or, or also potatoes, which are from South America, started growing these things in Europe or in places where they had never been before. So a lot of the names of these things really do come from the people who were the first to cultivate them. The word tomato comes from tomat, which uh, has uh, something to do with the word for water. It means like, but like juicy or like bursting with water, something like that. Um, also, avocado, which is a really funny etymology, um, comes from aguacat, which literally means testicle fruit, because the Aztecs gave it that name. Um, but uh, avocado was was used to make um, because you may you may be familiar with mole in modern Mexican cuisine is a whole variety of sauces. Um, av uh, mole comes from the word moli, which just means sauce. So avocado, aguacat, was used to make. Uh, aguacamole or avocado sauce, uh, which gives us the word guacamole. So lots of things that are that are still familiar to us today. The Aztecs are also kind of unique among, um, not not solely unique, but one of the few uh, indigenous societies that you find in um, in, uh, in the Americas who were. Uh, creating alcohol and were ferment making fermented alcoholic beverages, although they had a bit of a low status in their society. Public drunkenness was very frowned upon, and in general, al alcohol was supposed to be something that you only consumed under highly specific circumstances, like for festivals. Sometimes it was only given to the elderly, like the elders of the community, which you can see in the image from the Florentine Codex on the bottom. There's um, women with wrinkles and gray hair who were drinking um, octli, which was their name for what is now called pulque. Uh, pulque is the um, still produced in Mexico. I've I've had it actually. It's the it's the fermented sap of the maguey, which is the agave plant. Um, later on in the colonial era, when uh, distillation technology arrived in Mexico, they would take this sap and distill it and make tequila out of it. But the Aztecs didn't have that technology yet. So they just fermented it into a, a lighter, more beer-like uh, beverage, which is uh, pulque. Um, another, of course, super uh, famous and, and very popular today one uh, that, they were, that they enjoyed was uh, chocolate, which means bitter water, uh, which is chocolate. <laughs> 
And I mentioned before that this is something that would have been imported uh, from uh, to the south because the plant only grows in the tropics, as were many other different um, spices and ingredients that they were using. The Aztecs would have prepared cacao into a beverage primarily, which was very bitter and was flavored with spices and, and chili and different other things. Um, and this was actually when it was imported to Europe, the original chocolate was imported to Europe as a beverage before coffee had really caught on. Uh, it was like a pick me up like breakfast drink in Europe for a time among the upper classes. And it was popularized throughout Europe because of, it is said, um, because of the Spanish um, Spanish nobility who intermarried with other European royal families. And they brought this custom of drinking chocolate in the morning to different other countries. Um, Chile was a, was a very important condiment. It was such an important condiment that sometimes religious fasting, uh, of which the Aztecs did quite a bit, could include um, abstaining only from chili and salt. Uh, the image on the upper right is a very famous uh, passage in the, uh, in the Florentine Codex that describes Aztec mothers disciplining uh, their children uh, by uh, sticking their head in the smoke from burning chili peppers which even the Spanish in the 16th century thought was pretty harsh uh, to, be do to be doing to your children. Some of the other things that are listed down at the bottom are other um, spices that are still popular in, in Mexico today, like epazote, which is an, a strong smelling herb that's used still, and you know lots of these other indigenous uh, plants. Achiote, which produces a red uh, color. Mexican oregano, which is not the same as European oregano, but, but similar, is indigenous to, to Mexico. Now, of course, corn is so important uh, to the Aztec diet that it gets its own slide. Um, maize is the sacred staple crop. It's the center and like the cornerstone of Aztec society. And this is true of all Mesoamerican societies. It's one of the main characteristics anthropologically of the region is everybody's growing corn. And the Aztecs had this really lovely uh, poetic tradition, which in Spanish is called difrasismo, where they take... Uh, they refer to something metaphorically with a pair of matched names as a metaphor. So uh, the difrasismo for corn is our flesh, our bones, which just tells you how important it was and how sacred it was. It, and it kind of, you know, it was it was what was it was the lifeblood of their society. Corn was consumed at every meal. And it was made into various forms. It could be made into porridge into or, or drink. It could be made into tortillas, of which we know that there were tons of different sizes, thicknesses, colors even of tortillas. Also tamales, which would be filled with all manner of different things. We have evidence of, you know, or descriptions rather of, of various like vegetable or meat fillings, any type of, um, you know, every part of the corn even was used. The Aztecs figured out ways to eat the corn silk. They ate, you know, the, the they used the ashes from from burning the the the, the dead stalks. Everything was was used, and there was a tradition which you see in the um, which you see in the image there that when you would add the corn to the fire, you were supposed to blow on it, um, and it was like a almost like a prayer or religious characteristic to give. That, that that the corn doesn't fear the fire as you're as you're adding it to the cooking pot. Um, we also have an account that's reported in the Florentine Codex of um, corn was treated with such respect that um, if ever corn was scattered or fell on the ground, people had to stop and pick up every little grain and make sure that it wasn't left. And uh, Bernardino de Sahagún asked an Aztec person why they did this. And the response uh, was uh, the, the Aztec person is quoted saying, our sustenance suffers, it lies weeping. If we should not gather it up, it would accuse us before our God. It would say, this vassal picked me not up when I lay scattered on the ground, punish him, or perhaps we should starve. So there's this idea that you have to respect corn uh, in order to basically to survive. In Aztec mythology, the gods created the first men from uh, masa, which is corn dough. Um, so literally our flesh, our, our bones. Corn, uh, a lot of different gods are associated with corn. Uh, the two of them that I find some of the most interesting ones I, I have depicted here. Um, so the actual physical corn itself um, is associated with a husband and wife, a gods. Uh, Chica Mekoat is the goddess uh, and uh, Senteoc uh, is the god. And the two of them as husband and wife, they represent different stages of the corn's uh, growth. Um, 
so uh, the, uh, the, the wife represents the new fresh corn. And uh, they say that the, the corn silk of the new fresh ear is like her long hair. And then the husband god represents uh, the dried corn cob when it's been harvested at the end of the season. So they were worshipped during the, the planting and the harvest time. And um, there were all kinds of different processions and traditions that accompanied the, the planting in different stages of, of the corn. Um, another really interesting deity associated with the corn is, who's depicted on the right, uh, is Shipe Totek, uh, which means our lord, the, uh, the flayed, the flayed one. Um, he represents the renewal of springtime, and as the corn discards its dead husk and the new ear of corn is born, Shipetotex sheds his skin and is as is reborn. And so he's depicted with a skin that's like sloughing off. Um, but during the festival, of course, we know that the Aztecs practiced um, human sacrifice in some of their religious rituals. So during the festival of Shipetotec, human beings were sacrificed and their bodies were flayed and a priest would put on the, the skin and, and dance as a representation of the god. Um, I Once I gave this, I gave this talk, uh, by the way, and someone asked me this amazing question and asked me, um, the Aztecs knew so much about corn, did they eat popcorn? And I and then I and I didn't know, so I I did more research and I learned that yes, they did. <laughs> um, um, popcorn is called uh, totopoca, which is a, from the sound of the popping. And popcorn garlands were used as decoration and adornment uh, during religious festivals. And the popcorn was especially associated with the rain god because it was said to resemble hailstones. And one other word that I haven't uh, mentioned that's on this slide is um, nixtamalization. Um, Nixtamalization is a basically a process, uh, a processing technique that was developed by indigenous North American societies that grew corn. And it was essential to being able to eat the corn and being able to get their nutrition from it. Um, because uh, by, by doing this process to the corn, you are releasing uh, nutrients that otherwise our bodies would not be able to process, especially niacin and certain other essential nutrients that are found in it. So you're drastically increasing the nutritional value. And what you do is you uh, cook the, the, the corn grains in a solution of lime water, which is an alkaline solution. So they would mix... Um, they would mix in uh, some ash from burning wood. In coastal regions, people would use the uh, ash from burning seashells that has uh, chemicals in it like calcium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. And through this processing, it would become uh, nutritionally very available. And uh, the word nixtamalization, of course, comes from Nahuatl as well, it comes from a word uh, nishtamal. Most of the corn products that we can find today that are um, just on the market uh, are, are already nixtamalized. Uh, this is a common uh, industrial process now. But when uh, when corn was first brought to Europe in, uh, you know, and in the 19th century, they were trying to use it to help combat famine uh, in Europe. People didn't know how to do this. And so people, uh, populations that were trying to grow corn would suffer from nutritional deficiencies because they didn't know that you were supposed to nixtamalize the corn. Which is just one example of um, Europeans like taking these things and you know seeing the inherent value in them, but not listening to the people that actually are growing them and using them. Another great example of that is with tomatoes, of how there were sort of um, widespread misconceptions in Europe that tomatoes were poisonous, despite the fact that people in Mesoamerica had been eating tomatoes for thousands of years. But anyway, a lot of the things that I've mentioned already tie in with uh, religion. And with, um, you know, the, the, everything, you know, the, as in many historical societies, everything in the, the world of the Aztecs is tied in with the gods and with religion. There is no, um, there's no separation of, you know, the secular and the, and the religious. Uh, meals begin with a sacrifice. A sacrifice, we always think of when we hear the words Aztec sacrifice, we think of human sacrifice, but sacrifice could be a very small thing. It could be just putting aside a little offering of food for the god. It could be a personal uh, sacrifice where you might shed some of your own blood as an offering to a god, or you might uh, perform a ritual fast, which was very, very common. The Aztecs did more fasting in their religious calendar, even than, even than 16th century Catholics. The Spanish were actually astounded at the amount of fasting uh, that the Aztecs did, especially because apparently no one was exempt. The Catholics in the 16th century would allow 
elderly people or small children or very sick people um, to be exempt from religious fasts, but not so for, for the Aztecs. Um, there was this continuous idea, and that's, I think, where the concept of human sacrifice plays in so much into Mesoamerican religion, this idea that we have to thank, we have to constantly thank the gods for the gift of life. And we have to do this by giving up to them what is valuable to us. That it's, it's not a sacrifice if it doesn't, if you're not giving up something that's really meaningful and valuable. In Europe, in these societies, and not just Europe, but also like you know the Near East and even parts of Africa, in a lot of these societies where they have long traditions of herding livestock animals, and livestock animals are wealth. They represent uh, material wealth. And so you see a lot of religions where people perform sacrifices of livestock animals, where, you know, um, th this is very common in, in uh, you know, historical European societies. But the Aztecs didn't have an equivalent of that because they didn't have any one animal that was as equivalently valuable economically. And so the most economically valuable thing that you could offer to the gods would be a human life. And, and this is kind of where you get into the idea of human sacrifice. And just as in the, um, just as in European societies, very often when an animal was sacrificed, the meat would be consumed. Uh, it wasn't, it was offered to the gods and like consecrated, but people would eat it. It was kind of like a barbecue and people weren't eating um, meat every day, as e even in Europe. So it was a, it, it was like a first special occasion, like for a festival, it was an opportunity to eat a food you don't normally eat. In at least some uh, religious rituals among the Aztecs, they they also did a similar thing with humans, with human sacrifice. There are just not, it wasn't something they did all the time, but there are accounts of um, human flesh being consumed as part of religious rituals. There's a popular, we're not sure exactly how true this is, but there's a popular legend that um, pozole, which is a Mexican uh, stew that is uh, today, it's made with corn, but today it's uh, commonly includes pork. And uh, there's a popular legend that the original form of pozole was a ritual uh, food that was consumed and it was made with human flesh uh, rather than pork. But um, we're not 100% certain on that. Another thing that we are a bit more certain about its religious origins, though, which I find super fascinating, is um, I mentioned amaranth before. So on the right side is amaranth flowers. And um, in the center is an image of the god Huitzilopochtli, who is the patron god of the city of Tenochtitlan. And he's associated with war and with various things. His name means, his name can be, which I find fascinating, can be translated as the hummingbird of the south or the, the left-handed hummingbird. Um, but the amaranth was sacred to uh, Huitzilopochtli. And there was a particular religious ritual where the Aztecs would take the puffed grain of the amaranth, which is very tiny little grains, and they would mix it with honey. Uh, not only bee honey, but more commonly they use maguey honey, which is the sap from the agave. And they would uh, they, they would make this uh, like a sort of dough out of the grains and the honey, and they would shape it into a statue of a god. And then they would pr uh, carry it through the streets and at the end of the procession, they would cut up the statue into little pieces and everyone would eat it. And so the um, the Spanish, uh, when they encountered this custom, they were a bit horrified by this, even though it didn't involve human sacrifice or anything, but they were horrified by its resemblance to the, the Catholic communion. The idea that they are eating a, sim a symbol of the flesh of the God. And so they, in an attempt to put a stop to the practice, this was why they actually had outlawed uh, the growing of amaranth. But people continued to grow it in secret. And uh, eventually, today, similar types of sweets and candies are still popular and are still made for uh, holidays and, and just in general in Mexico. Nowadays, they make this sort of granola-like candy uh, out of amaranth, which is made into various shapes Nowadays, it often has nuts and fruit added to it, and it's called alegría, which is the Spanish word for joy, um, which I, I, I find very lovely. I, I've mentioned uh, some of these foods already um, that are still common in, um, you know, still commonly consumed in Mexico today, that these are just things that have indigenous uh, roots that go back to before the colonial era. Things like tortillas, things like, you know, um, Atole, which is a Mexican uh, sort of a corn porridge or beverage, like a thick uh, soupy kind of drink, all types of these different things. There were original versions. Some of them might have had new ingredients added into them, but 
we know of um, lots of, you know, lots of lots of very familiar stuff, actually, that the Aztecs would have been eating. Um, we think that uh, tortilla, which is the Spanish word for a little cake, um, we think that the original Aztec name for, name of it was Tlaxcali, which has a root uh, meaning something baked. And they were consumed with various different toppings. Often at uh, Aztec, uh, like an Aztec banquet, you might have um, a tortilla or a tamal in one hand and then like a stew or a soup or some type of dish like that in the other hand. So you're dipping the, uh, the corn-based food into um, something else more flavorful, basically, probably made with a lot of chili. Some of the other um some of the other foods that the Aztecs consume some of the animal uh sources of uh, and, and other sources of protein um I, I've alluded to them being like really creative and having to be resourceful because of the lack of their you know large animals in their environment um we know that they were hunting a lot of small game uh like you know iguanas uh, that animal in the upper left is a, a javelina or a peccary, which is a type of wild pig that is actually native to the to Central America. Um, they also had these little hairless dogs, which were apparently fattened on avocado uh, and raised for food. But again, you know, meat is not something that not something that everybody has as a major part of their of their diet. Um, dogs seem to have. Don't seem to have not uh, been especially valued by the Aztecs as companions or pets. They weren't like a highly regarded animal in this in the way that they are in many uh, cultures today. But they were still important because they they could be providing a source of food. And that little hairless dog, the Xolo Itzquintli, is still a, a breed that still exists in Mexico today. That's sometimes called the Mexican hairless dog. Um, we know that they consume lots of different eggs. Uh, and, uh, you know, lots of game like birds, uh, turkeys, actually, the one that would have been native that they would have been raising for their eggs and meat is uh, not the not the, the one that we have in uh, upper part of North America, a different species that has very, very beautiful plumage called the oscillated turkey would have been the one that they were using. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, the, the axolotl, uh, which is originally pronounced axolot. Uh, is this this water salamander creature? Uh, those are native to the alkaline lakes of Mexico. Uh, they are extinct in the wild nowadays. We mostly know them as a curiosity or as a weird pet, um, but the Aztecs ate them as well, and they grew large enough uh, to be basically worth uh, hunting. They were they grew to be like the size of a dog, according to accounts. Um, so these big salamanders, there's all kinds of river and, and uh, lake creatures that they were also eating, tadpoles, frogs, you know, many kinds of fish, uh, crayfish, I, I'm, acosil, which is a, a species of crayfish that's native to, um, that's native to, to Mexico. Um, there's a, and then of course, uh, insects uh, were another uh, a source of protein. And Mexico, I, I, I've heard, um, has the, you know, one of the of any country in the world, one of the kind of largest traditions of uh, insects as a source of food for human beings. There's there's so many different species of insects that are consumed still in, in parts of Mexico. And this is, again, because uh, the Aztecs had to get creative when they didn't have large livestock animals. And um, they had to, you know, they, they, they had to kind of find this type of food wherever they could. Uh, chapulines, as they're known in modern Mexico, are grasshoppers, uh, are a especially common one. When I was in um, when I was in Oaxaca in Mexico last year, I saw very large quantities of grasshoppers being sold, like roasted in the market. Um, and what's cool about them is that they are pests; they're agricultural pests. So they are taken from fields that are being grown for grain or or for um, uh, you know other purposes, and they're and they're just removed, uh, and then they are an additional source of food. Another um, really special uh, insect food that I would love to try one day, but it's very rare and hard to find now, is something called awautle, which is sometimes known as Mexican caviar. Um, awautle is actually the word for amaranth because it is the eggs of a type of water insect. That's the creature on the bottom left. And uh, it looks like tiny little little grains of amaranth. So the Aztecs called it by the same name. Um, so it was, it apparently tasted like shrimp and they used to harvest it from the, from the rivers. They also used to even, um, there were teeming hordes of insects, like little flies, midges, like rising off of the lakes. They would catch them and get so many of them that they could mash them together into like a solid form where you wouldn't even see the individual insects. And this was another source of food. Similarly, 
you may have heard of uh, spirulina, spirulina algae. The Aztecs were some of the first people to consume spirulina, which today is recognized as being like a health food. It's very high in um, uh, B vitamins and, and other nutrients. Um, the Aztecs harvested uh, spirulina from the lakes of Mexico. And they would, again, they would press it and dry it in the sun and make these little cakes out of it. It has a very grassy taste. Um, and uh, that, but, the, but because of the way it was aged and dried in the sun um, and then later like crumbled on top of other food, uh, the Spanish compared it to cheese. They called it the Aztec cheese, even though it was very dark and it didn't look like cheese. Um, spirulina, by the way, was known to the Aztecs as tequitlat, which means rock poop because they didn't know exactly where it came from. So they imagined it as like being generated by the by the rocks. Um, I, I also, I, uh, again, the uh, the chat is open if anyone wants to ask a question, but um, I, the, the kind of last thing I wanted to touch upon was dining habits, um, which we know a bit more about uh, how the elite Aztecs were eating uh, because that's more documented of kind of the banquets of, of, of the elite. Uh, I mentioned fasting already as being an important part of Aztec society, but when it's not a fasting time, you would be eating, you know, two or maybe, maybe three meals per day. And at a banquet, um, there's no tables or chairs or utensils. You're kind of all sitting gathered around and you have your um, bowls for dipping and then your tortilla or tamal in the other hand. Um, there was a custom for banquets that you would actually start the banquet with an offering of tobacco and flowers. So tobacco, by the way, is native to North America. So people would smoke tobacco and then they would pass around flowers and they would use them to cleanse their hands. They would crush the flowers in their fingers because they were gonna be eating with their hands. But the purpose of the tobacco, interestingly, as we still recognize this today, tobacco is an appetite suppressant. And so the purpose of the tobacco was actually to um, make you make you a little less hungry so that you didn't overeat because the Aztecs were very big on showing restraint. That was considered a kind of a morally good uh, sign of your character was to the same as I mentioned, public drunkenness was very frowned upon. So um, the, you know, you didn't want to be too gluttonous at a, at a banquet. So you might uh, smoke a little bit of tobacco before you started eating. For special feasts and religious uh, occasions, um, is certain intoxicants were consumed, uh, not only alcohol, but also, um, the, you know, cacao produces a very mild stimulant buzz effect because of a compound in it called theobromine, as well as caffeine. Um, and uh, there were other, you know, other types of intoxicants that the Aztecs had as well. Uh, mushrooms, the same ones that we today uh, use recreationally and refer to as like magic or psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, those were were known to the Aztecs, uh, and they called them uh, uh, teonanakat, which means the the food of the gods, and they were used in highly religious, uh, con you know, connotations for inducing divine visions. Um, this here at the end, uh, this is an image. Um, this is an image from a, a mural um, that that shows, you know, the um, it shows again a, like a market scene of uh, of, of uh, Tenochtitlan by uh, Diego Rivera, the very very famous uh, modern Mexican artist. And something that I find so amazing with the Aztecs is just like to imagine the city and imagine the city of Tenochtitlan was like, you know, the Spanish themselves re recorded that it was as large as the cities of Europe at the time. It was a, it was this like metropolis. There were it was so highly organized. It was, um, they, it, you know, is it a remarkable feat of engineering. It was like Venice in the way that it was built on top of a lake and had these canals as well as the agricultural system. Um, and so, you know, I, I love kind of thinking about that lost world a bit and imagining, you know, that as like, a, you know, the, that it makes sense that such a diverse and fascinating culture of food could come out of um, this, out of this amazing city, basically. But I wanted to end on a, a quote, um, which this is a description from uh, Hernan Cortez, from the, the conqueror himself, uh, in his in one of his letters that he wrote to King Charles of Spain. Uh, this one is dated October 30th, 1520. Um, so he, it, it's letters in which he's describing basically the wonders that he's witnessing uh, in, in the new world. Uh, and so he says, talking about Tenochtitlan, the city has many public squares in which are situated the markets and other places for buying and selling. 
There's one square twice as large as that of the city of Salamanca, surrounded by porticos where are daily assembled more than 60,000 souls engaged in buying and selling, and where are found all kinds of merchandise that the world affords, embracing the necessaries of life, as for instance, articles of food, as well as jewels of gold and silver. There's also an herb street where may be obtained all sorts of roots and medicinal herbs that the country affords. Apothecary shops where prepared medicines, liquids, ointments, and plasters are sold, and restaurants that furnish food and drink at a certain price. Everything that can be found throughout the whole country is sold in the markets, comprising articles so numerous that to avoid prolixity and because their names are not retained in my memory or are unknown to me, I shall not attempt to enumerate them. Every kind of merchandise is sold in a particular street or quarter assigned to it exclusively, and thus the best order is preserved. <laughs> 